Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining me. This is our weekly Chats on the Past program where the museum discusses history with scholars, authors, historians, and artisans. My name is Nicole Carpenter and I am the Director of Programs and Education at the Westport Museum for History and Culture. As always, this program is presented to you free of charge. We do, as always, ask for your continued support, whether that is through our suggested donation of $5 for our programs or simply following us on our social media accounts. You can follow us and like us on Facebook and Twitter at Westport History and on Instagram at Westport History Museum. If you have any questions, comments, or anecdotes that you would like to share uh, related to our program this evening, please post them in the chats box and I will get to as many of those at the end as we can. I will of course ask our wonderful speaker to answer as many of those as she can. This evening we are joined by Dr. Colleen Darnell, who's a celebrated Egyptologist and award-winning author. She has taught at Yale and the University of Hartford and has been featured in countless documentaries and educational programming related to Egyptian art, architecture, and culture. Colleen has also curated the groundbreaking exhibition at the Yale Peabody Museum entitled Echoes of Egypt, Conjuring the Land of the Pharaohs. So welcome, Colleen. Thank you so much for having me, Nicole. Of course. So tonight, we are going to start with uh, our first question. We do have a, ver a, a series of questions we are going to ask before we jump into our audience questions. So our very first one is, Colleen, today you teach Egyptian history and art and architecture. Uh, and what sparked your passion for Egyptian history? And how did you become interested in Egyptology? That is always a difficult question to answer precisely because I was so young <laughs> when I became interested in Egyptology. And I feel like it's just always been with me. So when I was a child, I read voraciously about ancient Egypt, tried to teach myself as many hieroglyphs as I could, and even built a replica, uh, which just happened to be a few books on a shelf and some artifacts of the Library of Alexandria. So I, I always loved it. And it's so interesting having been an Egyptologist for so long and now also being into a lot more of the fashion and the vintage side of things is continually rediscovering my interest in Egypt. So I think when we talk about this interest in the past, it's not just, oh, well, I loved it as a child and I love it the same way now. Like it really grows and develops and rediscovering all these new and exciting aspects is what to me makes it so much fun. And how often are you um, visiting Egypt? I know that both you and your husband are both Egyptologists. How often are you able to, to visit archeological sites? In a normal year, we spend uh, December and half of January, and then normally May and part of June in Egypt, working uh, with the expedition that my husband directs, uh, John Darnell, the uh, El Cobb Desert Survey Project. So that has been amazing to work on. And in, again, a normal year, for example, May of 2017, we found the earliest monumental hieroglyphic inscription. So 5,250 years old. The other hieroglyphs of that date were about an inch high. These were over two feet high. So it's been remarkable. And sadly, like so many things uh, that has been postponed for the summer, but we look forward to getting back as soon as possible. I look forward to hearing about your expeditions in the future. Uh, in your uh, book in 2013, you published the book Imagining the Past, Historical Fiction in New Kingdom Egypt. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about historical fiction in Egypt and also more about the, the primary sources that you were using and then also the findings um, of that book? I, I'm so glad you asked that. I love talking about historical fiction in ancient Egypt. and. When we think about Egypt and historical fiction, I think our minds go to Wilbur Smith or modern authors writing novels set in ancient Egypt. And 
the ancient Egyptians themselves had historical fiction. And so that's what I was writing about, is that in the reign of Ramses II, circa 1250 BCE, they were setting stories two and even 300 years in the past. And we don't have curricula from ancient Egypt. We don't know how they learned grammar, how they learned history, how they learned even, even hieroglyphs. I mean, we know obviously they did and they learned hieratic, the cursive form, before they even learned hieroglyphs. That was typically reserved for upper echelon bureaucrats and priests. But we don't know what the average student studied of their own history. So I think my most important finding in imagining the past was that in order for the story to be entertaining, you have to know who the characters are. So if you read Wildfell Hall, and you don't know who Henry VIII is, it's not gonna be as entertaining, right? So by looking back to the reign of Thutmose III, if you're already in the reign of Ramses II, going back to the end of the Second Intermediate Period, you really get this sense of what they must have at least had as basic knowledge and the fact that they transition history into an entertaining story with both real and possibly some fictional characters. It's, it's difficult to say because we don't always have all the documentation, but that was really fun to see the papyri, uh, work on them in the British Museum, as well as working from additional photographs and be able to produce a new translation that also characterized these for the first time as a genre of historical fiction. Now I have to ask, do you have a favorite Egyptian historical fiction author? That is Agatha Christie, because in addition to Death on the Nile, she wrote a novel called Death Comes as the End, set in ancient Egypt, because her husband, Max Malawan, was a Mesopotamian archaeologist. So she was able to access translations of letters in the Metropolitan Museum from about 4,000 years ago, even before the Egyptological edition was published. So that is by far my favorite novel set in ancient Egypt. And I think it's this gem of Agatha Christie's work that is not as well known as her novels, obviously set in more, more modern times in the 1930s. <laughs> You also mentioned that uh, Egyptian writers are are writing these uh, these narratives about both true and possibly kind of mythological figures. Are they writing purely uh, in, uh, stories from the past in Egypt, or are they also expanding into other um, kingdoms that they know of? The four stories that we have are set in Egypt as well as to the Northeast when they're fighting wars uh, in, uh, in their Northeastern territories. So the story called The Capture of Joppa, that's just the modern title we give to it, has this really interesting ruse where to get into the city, the Egyptians pretend to surrender, and then they say, here are these baskets that are the first of our tribute, but there are soldiers hidden inside. So it really is a Trojan horse-like stratagem. So they often will set these stories abroad, or they seem to revolve around military themes. So I think the historical fiction in ancient Egypt might have particularly appealed to military scribes, or at least were composed in that milieu. You also mentioned that there seems to be um, a lack of understanding in the, the curriculum. Is that something that is being researched by other Egyptologists at the time, something that we believe we will be able to, to understand more fully in the future? Is that something that is at least seemingly lost to us? In order to answer those sorts of questions, we would have to have more papyri. So the hieroglyphic text that we have in, in abundance, historical inscriptions, military annals, autobiographical texts, they don't provide the handbooks, the textbooks 
what students would have learned. All of that would have been written on papyrus scrolls and hieratic, and so few of those have survived. For example, with the stories of historical fiction, we have one copy each of those four stories. So if a single papyrus over those 3,000, approximately 200 years, if one of those papyri had been damaged or lost, we would not even know the existence of that story. So, so much of our knowledge is just dependent on these very tenuous preservations of papyri. So if another cache of papyri were to be found, I mean, there was, there was a really impressive discovery on the Red Sea coast of a journal of a man who hauled stones for the Great Pyramid as it was being completed. But that's one of the very few papyri discoveries that have been made recently. Now, if we jump a bit forward in time from Egyptians uh, writing historical fiction um, to the 1920s, uh, I think that probably most of us know that uh, Pharaoh Tutankhamun's tomb was found in the 1920s and 1922. Um, and in the US and probably globally, uh, it reignited this interest in Egyptian culture. There's costume and film and all of this renewed um, interest. How else have uh, Americans viewed Egyptian culture throughout history? And is it really this, this large boom in the 1920s uh, that continues on later? There is definitely a new phase of Egyptomania that we can almost term tutmania that, that begins after the 1920s. But the example that I always use to explain how very much this was in the air, even prior to the discovery of the tomb of Tutankhamun, is Grauman's Egyptian Theater in Los Angeles. It was completed in October of 1922. Tutankhamun's tomb was found in November. So obviously, Grauman's Egyptian Theater was not because of the discovery of the tomb of Tutankhamun. It just happened to be absolutely fabulous timing. So I did want to share with the audience a piece of my personal collection that I have not yet shared on Instagram or YouTube. And this is a 1920s Egyptian beaded purse. And you can see the winged sun disc down below and all these beautiful colors. And the winged sun disc design is actually on a number of Egyptian revival monuments from the 19th century, and Connecticut has some of the most important of them. So my absolute far and above favorite is the Grove Street Cemetery Gateway in New Haven that was built in 1845. So Egyptian revival begins much earlier in the 19th century, tends to end about the time of really the 1850s, 1860s, it, it falls off in the United States, but it's really going again in the first two decades of the 20th century. Uh, another great example besides Grauman's Egyptian theater is a whole series of Palmolive soap ads from the late 19 teens, and even a dance dress designed by the famous ballroom dancer Irene Castle that has hieroglyphs on it again, from uh, before the First World War. So it's, Tutankhamun has a definite impact. I mean, we cannot deny the worldwide media craze that was the discovery of the tomb of Tutankhamun, but it continues a trend and explodes a trend more than begins one. We did have a audience member uh, comment, if I can find it here. Uh, wasn't there a period of Egypt mania in the mid 19th century? I think you might have spoken to that uh, very briefly there. Yes, and in addition to Egyptian revival architecture, we also see mummy unwrappings that became very popular in 1850 and 1851. Uh, there was a British man named uh, George Glidden, who advertised these big mummy unwrappings in the 1850s. And the story, going back to the Echoes of Egypt exhibit that you mentioned, that I uh, curated in 2013, is that we recreated a mummy unwrapping 
and had a, an advertisement from one of George Glidden's unwrappings. And he became rather infamous when he promised to be unwrapping an ancient Egyptian priestess that got turned in the press to princess. And at the end of three days, when the body was fully revealed, uh, that Egyptian princess had something no princess should have. And it was very embarrassing for Glidden. And he deflected it by claiming that the coffin makers and the embalmers had made a mistake, when actually it's because he didn't know how to read hieroglyphs. <laughs> oh, dear. Um, well, <laughs> so, speaking of, um, of mummies, um, of course, here in Connecticut, a part of the uh, Barnum's Museum in Bridgeport, a part of their collection is, of course, an Egyptian mummy. Um, and I'm wondering if you can speak a, a little bit to, to their mummy, but also what other resources uh, we have in Connecticut relating to um, Egyptian artifacts and mummies. The Barnum mummy was actually the mummy we used in the exhibit. And it's interesting that when we think about the ancient Egyptians and seeing their artifacts or seeing, for example, the mummy case that's also in the Barnum Museum. The mummy case belonged to a man named Pa'ib from the 26th dynasty, whereas the mummy is female and probably of a much earlier era. So it really played into the whole George Glidden mummy unwrapping mistake story precisely because when Nancy Fish Barnum donated the mummy and then they unwrapped it in 1894, the gender of the mummy did not match the coffin. So it was clearly not an original set. And that is a really neat part of Connecticut Egyptian artifacts. And the other thing that we did with the exhibit is that I think Pa'ib would be totally content with people speaking his name. That's how you gain immortality in ancient Egypt. I think he would be totally happy having his mummy case visible. They never intended mummies themselves to be seen. So one of the nice things about staging this mummy unwrapping is that we covered all but the head of the female mummy that was given to the Barnum Museum in a, in a linen shroud so that it was as if the unwrapping was taking place, but we could still talk about the mummy and give her pride of place in the exhibit without actually showing the body. And, and that was really important to me uh, in, in the curation. So in addition to the Barnum mummy, the biggest holdings of Egyptian artifacts in Connecticut are the Yale University Art Gallery and especially the Peabody Museum. They, they have a spectacular collection because of the division of finds and the acquisition of known excavated objects. So that's really neat because unlike say an art collection where, for example, Nancy Fish Barnum acquired the mummy, clearly they didn't even match with the archeological material that was um, acquired by the Peabody in the late 19th century, early 20th century, is that you know where it's from. It, it has a provenance. And, and that's really important and speaks to why illegal excavations and tomb robbery is, is so harmful because you lose the context of the information. Uh, another question that we have is, uh, Obviously, Egyptian culture is very, very complex and it changes over time, but are there lasting impacts that uh, art, philosophy, architecture, um, worship, and daily practices uh, that still live on today or have an impact on um, our, our audiences um, in modern times? Every time you write the letter A, you are writing an ancient Egyptian hieroglyph. Every time you write the letter B, you are writing an ancient Egyptian hieroglyph. And we know how the alphabet was invented by probably early Semitic speakers 
and Egyptians working together. The Egyptians could write their names. They could write things on the rocks. They could um, talk about what they did. And so this cooperation led to people who spoke a different language being able to write their own names. And then that uh, eventually led to obviously a much <laughs> a script that has taken over, uh, you know, certainly um, uh, our language. So it, it's neat that that's probably the most definite influence on the modern world uh, from ancient Egypt. And uh, the last question that I have prepared before we jump into our audience questions is, are there any icons or recognizable pieces of Egyptian culture um, in our modern society? Uh, are there architectural forms um, that we can still see? Normally just in Egyptian revival buildings. So there aren't a lot of architectural forms where it has simply continued. And even if you look at Greek revival, one of the reasons why it's a revival is because it was rather out of fashion for a while. So with Egyptian revival, it's a conscious borrowing of, for example, a cavetto cornice, where the upper part of the wall will curve out. That's very distinctly Egyptian form, or the torus molding, or even the battered sides of the pylon shape, like the Grove Street Cemetery Gateway in New Haven. So normally, if it's a conscious Egyptian revival, you can find those idioms. One of the other examples is in cemeteries. Sometimes they will use the winged sun disk as a motif because of how popular Egyptian revival motifs were for funerary contacts in the 19th century. Uh, the museum actually holds a funeral or a gravestone artwork tour in one of our cemeteries in town. And I don't think we have any sun disks, but there are definitely um, some very interesting forms there that we see throughout different times. Um, and I would love to see a, a sun disk um, <laughs> stone. Unfortunately, I don't think we have one in Westport, but I would love to see one. Although you do have obelisks. We do have you obelisks. Have obelisks. We do. So actually, obelisks. I'm going to amend my answer. Obelisk. <laughs> that, that is the idiom <laughs> that is from ancient Egypt that is ubiquitous. We all know it because of the Washington Monument and every single historic cemetery um, in New England. So yes, I amend that. Obelisk. We definitely do. I know that we have at least two obelisks in at least one cemetery. So we have a, a small piece of um, our own <laughs> architecture reminiscent of, of Egypt. So that's excellent. Um, we do have uh, a couple of audience questions. And one of them is, what is your thought on holding of, of mummies in Western museums today in terms of the lack of cultural sensitivity particularly with respect to race and ethnicity? That, that's a very good question. And if we look back to the mummy unwrappings of the 1850s, George Glidden and some of the other people involved with the mummy unwrappings and the collection of skulls were very much trying to advance racist scientific inquiry. Uh, precisely trying to trace the origins of different peoples by studying skulls. So it is really important to recognize the awful side of the interest in Egypt in the 19th century, precisely because of, of what George Glidden was doing. And it, it's a really complex issue because of how, well, I mean, you should, I, I think it would be interesting to hear in terms of deaccessioning and, and museums because I've curated an exhibit, but I'm not a curator within a museum context. Um, so how do you handle like deaccessioning of objects? Because I think that's a, a larger ethical question in museums in general. It is a, a very tricky uh, question within museums, especially when you're dealing with uh, human remains. Um, we, uh, very luckily in our collection, we do not hold any 
uh, human remains. Um, we do not have to um, kind of grapple with that question of how to ethically tell the story of the past while uh, also preserving these pieces, but also dealing with the cultural sensitivities, especially in this area, we are uh, especially worried about indigenous artifacts. Mm -hmm. um, there are artifacts, of course, that are appropriate to display and to celebrate indigenous history, but there are others that really should be repatriated back to tribes for reburial or uh, preservation within their community. Um, so it is, it's a very, very tricky, um, a very tricky question. Um, I think your idea of being able to preserve the name in the way that is culturally appropriate um, is a fabulous uh, take on that, uh, that particular subject, but it really is very particular to the kind of uh, culture, um, whether it's Egyptian or indigenous or um, even a more local kind of community within a family history, it's always best to do um, what is dictated by that culture while still being able to tell a truthful story of the past. So it, it is very, very tricky. Um, and I did have a follow-up question, Colleen, actually, as you were mentioning um, uh, the skulls that were collected within the uh, mid-19th. Does that lead into um, studies of skull shape that we understand with the eugenics movement. Is that closely related with that practice? Yes, unfortunately, the study of the skulls and phrenology are all related to the quote-unquote racial science of, of the 19th century. And this is something that I, I've studied in the context of interactions with Egyptian mummies. So I can't speak to, to all of the complexities of, of that very dark part of, of the past, but certainly uh, that, was, that was part of, of the interest in the mummy unwrappings. And, and we mentioned that, in fact, in, in the 2013 catalog, uh, I wrote some of the material about the mummies, as well as a, a wonderful scholar, uh, S.J. Wolf, who has studied a lot of the mummy mania interaction between uh, particularly Americans and mummies in the 19th century. And she does a really great job of pulling together the primary source material. So we have another question. This is a bit longer of a question. So they start um, by saying, we all remember the resaturation or restoration of Tutankhamun's mask and the fires at the Brazil National Museum that destroyed many artifacts. We remember the famous ones like the mask. What are some other artifacts that have a story worth telling that aren't with us anymore? Ooh, um, that's, that's a very good question. So the Tutankhamun mask itself with all of the artifacts from Tutankhamun's tomb are in Cairo. And it's really amazing to see what is being done with the Grand Egyptian Museum and when that is ready to open. And I've already, I was incredibly fortunate to get a tour of their conservation labs. And it is simply remarkable. I mean, oh, the, yes, <laughs> yes the, the facilities and how they are collecting all of the artifacts from Tutankhamun's tomb to be displayed together is, is really amazing. In terms of, I really have to think about specific lost artifacts besides the more recent example with, with Brazil uh, would be some of the artifacts destroyed in Germany during World War II. So fortunately the bust of Nefertiti, uh, the vast majority of artifacts uh, made it and, and were stored and then recovered, but a lot of things are still missing. And I, I don't have the exact numbers or a particular, I think there is a Stila, a very, um, one of the last people who describe playing with hieroglyphs and what they mean and wanting people to continue to write them, which again gets this idea of the cultural sensitivity of how would the ancient Egyptians have seen us continuing to read hieroglyphic inscriptions. And that stela, I believe, was lost in World War II. Uh, so 
that is probably the most, the, the largest example from, from the 20th century. We have a, another question here from uh, Daria, and she says um, soon she will be a uh, medicine student, uh, and she's wondering if you could tell us anything about the ancient Egyptians and medicine. Awesome question. So the Egyptians were incredibly well known in the ancient world for the quality of their doctors. And it really is amazing the specialties that they had. So they had dentists, they had military surgeons. There's even a triage manual where the doctor has different cases and it seems to be related to the military because a lot of it is blunt head trauma. So we have to assume this is not something that you would normally see in, in day to day life. And there are three categories, either this is something that I can treat, this is something with which I will contend, or this is something where we have to go into the realm of magic and amulets. And for the Egyptians, magic is an extension of religion. So it's not as if they're saying there's nothing scientific to be done, we're now gonna switch to magic. It's simply a recognition that they don't have the ability to solve the problem in a physical way. And I think that almost holistic sense of medicine is very interesting because the hope that it might have given someone that you know they might be on the edge and yet they know that a certain ritual or magical spell is being spoken that the psychosomatic power of that could, you know, I don't think we should, we should discount that. They even had from the Middle Kingdom 4,000 years ago, a gynecological papyrus. So we know they were really skilled in terms of what they could do at the time. And you mentioned uh, medicine and also magical practices. Um, and this, uh, it might not be directly related, but this reminded me of your other book of the translation of the, um, the Netherworlds. Um, could you talk about that just very briefly for our audience? In 2018, uh, John and I published the first complete English translation of the hieroglyphic text in the Valley of the Kings and in, in the royal tombs. So that was really amazing. And those are theological compositions, but we also talk about them as scientific treatises because it is trying to imagine what this other part of the universe that we cannot directly experience, or at least shouldn't directly experience until we die, uh, but that the sun god experiences every single night. So that they imagine what was the topography, what kind of gods inhabited that space. The Egyptians divided the day into 24 hours so that the night consisted of 12 hours. So they divided up 12 and 12. And they have very elaborate calculations with water clocks and such of how, how to tell the time and, and also observing stars. It's really remarkable. And in that text, we also get this sense of the power of the spoken word. And when the sun god speaks, things happen. And that idea of the performative power of speech is part of how ancient Egyptian magic works. So it's a fairly different set of texts from what we would call magical texts, but it certainly relates precisely because magic is an extension of religion and the sun god has the most powerful magic, the most powerful, what we call ahu, power, this, this efficacious power. That's fantastic. Now, several of our audience members have asked the same question. <laughs> um, they would all like to know what you are wearing this evening. They, <laughs> they love your fashion sense. Um, and we'd also like to know um, a bit more about your, your vintage collection. You showed that wonderful piece, um, that beaded purse. Um, and we would love to know how your personal style has evolved along with your scholarly interest and then also just what your lovely ensemble is tonight. <laughs> <laughs> so the cloche is 
1920s, as is the dress. It's an Irish crochet uh, lace, so perfect for the summer. And the necklace as well is, is Art Deco period. So since we're talking about Connecticut Egyptian artifacts, I'm going to give a shout out to my two favorite vintage stores in Connecticut, uh, in New Haven, Fashionista and Civis. And they are awesome. So if you want to work on your own vintage wardrobe, I, I would head straight to New Haven to Fashionista and Civis. Wonderful. Thank you so much. So I think that is all of the questions that we have this evening. Um, is there somewhere that our audience can follow you, Colleen? You can follow me on Instagram at Vintage Egyptologist. And in addition to our photos there, uh, John and I also have started a YouTube channel. We stick, we stuck with the same name, Vintage Egyptologist. So we go, it's a pretty deep dive into hieroglyphs and a lot about the Netherworld books and the Valley of the Kings. And uh, we're planning quite a number of additional videos. So follow Vintage Egyptologist on Instagram and then go subscribe on YouTube. Thank you so much, Colleen. And thank you all for joining us this evening. Um, if you have any other questions, please do post them um, on this video. And of course, if you're watching this recording on Facebook, do put your comments below. We, of course, are always happy to try and answer those questions at the museum, or we are always happy to try and reach out to our speakers and have those questions answered. So thank you so much for joining us this evening, Colleen. Thank you for having me. And everyone have a wonderful weekend. Good evening, everyone. Bye-bye.